Hi, I'm Pete Duncanson, Media Arts Pastor, and I'd like to take a moment to say thank you for being here. If you are physically here with us today, please be aware that for your safety, we are practicing social distancing and ask you to respect those that are using precautions as well. If you'd like to know more about what is going on right here at Central, whether upcoming events or just learning about who we are, check us out on the web, Facebook, and yes, we even have an app for that. If the ministry at Central has blessed you and you would like to give, you can do that multiple ways. By using the physical boxes located in the back by the sound booth, through online giving, or even through our app. Thanks again for joining us today, and God bless. Amen. Thank you for joining us today. Those of you who are watching by live stream, thank you for being here. Those of you who are in the building, wow, thank you. God bless you. I know I get a reprieve from my mask for just a few moments while I'm up here with you, but thank you for understanding. I believe we're in a season where the state probably feels great pressure to close everything down, including houses of worship, but they have said as long as we maintain our limited capacity and our social distancing and our masks that we are welcome to worship the Lord. And I say if they're going to show us that kind of respect, we're going to show them the respect of wearing our masks even when we're in here. Thank you for uh, doing all of that. We appreciate the opportunity to worship God together. Amen? And we may have to curtail it at some point. Even yesterday I was debating whether to just send out another announcement and say, listen, we're not going to be in the building tomorrow. We, we have a number of folks who are positive now, and we need to just remember how important it is to be as safe as possible. Happy Thanksgiving to each of you, to all of you who are on live stream. Happy Thanksgiving. For those of you in other nations, you know, most of you, all my friends, you know how big of a holiday this is for us in America, where we um, eat a turkey, I don't know why, and we um, watch football. I'm not sure about either of those, but that's not the meaning of the holiday at all. We're very, very grateful for all that God has done for us. Amen. Well, we're going to make it through this morning. Brother Ricky just had uh, no, was notified that he is not positive with the virus, so he's here this morning. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> It was touch and go right up until about 30 minutes ago, but we, we decided that me leading worship would not be the best thing for us today, so you are in great, great hands. But we are trying to do a lot of things here in the building and on the campus to limit our exposure. I've told you for weeks now the virus is just moving everywhere, and we recognize that. Let's open with prayer this morning. Father, we thank you for the goodness of our God. We thank you that you are strengthening us and keeping us day by day. On this Thanksgiving Sunday, we do just that. We give you thanks, Lord. Glory to God. Thank you for all that you do for us. Thank you for providing for us and delivering us, for sustaining us and keeping us by your great power, Lord. We open our hearts to you today and say, do great and mighty things through us. Yes, even do miracles here in us, through us, and among us. And we will give you all the praise for it in Jesus' mighty name. And all of God's people said, amen, amen. Come on. Let's... What, a, uh, what a great turnout here in the building, even though we are in the climate and situation we're in. I, I feel like I'm not at center. Am I centered? I don't feel like I am. I'm going to move just a little bit, okay, because that bothers me. And uh, <laughs> it might bother you, but it might not, but it does bother me. We... Um, May, I, I need to talk to Pastor Adam more about this, but I think we're probably, I'm feeling like, need to close the office this week, the church office. So before you come out here or call or anything, uh, or before you come out here, please call and make sure if you need anything this week. It's holiday week. Um, I probably know of more people who are positive or waiting for test results within our congregation than anybody else does. And I'm just a little bit anxious about what I what I know. So it may be that we close out. We're going to be closed. Obviously, we will not have church Wednesday night anyways. This is Thanksgiving week. We always do that. Trust that you will enjoy your time by yourself. And next year, 
with family, right? So uh, right now, Thanksgiving is uh, the one we're used to, the traditional Thanksgiving, is about 370 days away from us. Amen? So you can start preparing right now. Praise God. Um, Anything else I need to mention this morning? We've had some um, deaths in our church this week and um, really praying for those of you who have lost loved ones really throughout this year. It's been so difficult for those who have had to uh, process through that. Maybe, maybe you're waiting to do a memorial service next year or whatever it might be. It's just very, very difficult time. All right, go in your Bible this morning to the book of Nehemiah. Book of Nehemiah chapter 9. And while you're doing that, let me say, as I, I try to so often, Thank you so very much for your giving here at the church. You continue, uh, you who are here on live stream in the building, you are are just incredible in your support and giving to the church. God bless you. And uh, at the same time, we have many others who are uh, not really connected to the church, but through this year, they have just felt like, hey, I need to get connected and uh, they're giving. Thank you. You may not be in the building or even joining us on live stream, but you have begun to support what's happening here. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, the book of Nehemiah today, I, I just got caught up in a word this week, and I'll take you to that at the end of the message, a single word. But then that took me into this text, and I saw all of this thanksgiving taking place in this text. Verse 1, on October 31, the people assembled again, and this time they fasted and dressed in burlap and sprinkled dust on their heads. Wow. They fasted, they dressed in burlap. I've never done that, but I'm assuming that's not comfortable. It doesn't seem like it would be all that comfortable. It seems like it's a pretty big deal. I don't see anybody doing it in the New Testament, but maybe, maybe it would be okay to try it once in a while. I don't know. It's intended, from what I've read, it's intended to demonstrate humility and sorrow and um, discomfort, I guess. And they sprinkled dust on their heads. Those of Israelite descent separated themselves from all foreigners as they confessed their own sins and the sins of their ancestors. Wow. Wow. They remain standing in place for three hours, the New Living says, the Hebrew says a quarter of a day, while the book of the law of the Lord their God was read aloud to them. Then for three more hours they confessed their sins and worshipped the Lord God. So we've had two confessions, once before they'd even heard the word of God, and that was more of a kind of a general confession, mostly saying, God, forgive what all my great-grandparents did. But once they had heard God's word... They said, God, forget about my great-grandparents and forgive me. You know, something about the word, isn't it? Yeah, the word uh, helps us to see us. Now, we're going to try to figure out all these people. The Levites, Jeshua, Bani, or Bani, Cadmiel, Shabana, Shabaniah, Bunny, Sherebiah, Bani again, that's Bani, I guess, number two, and Kenani stood on the stairway of the Levites and cried out to the Lord their God with loud voices. Then the leaders of the Levites, Jeshua, Cadmiel, Bani, (laughs) Hashabniah, Sherebiah, Hodiah, Shebaniah, and Pethahiah, Uh, some of those may be the same people, called out to the people, stand up and praise the Lord your God, for he lives from everlasting to everlasting. Then they prayed, may your glorious name be praised, may it be exalted above all blessing and praise. Wow, may it be exalted above all blessing and praise. I'm going to grab verse 6 as well. I was not going to do that, but I am now. You alone are the Lord. You made the skies and the heavens and all the stars. You made the earth and the seas and everything in them. You preserved them all, and the angels of heaven worship you. Not one angel refuses to worship God, not one. Not one angel does anything but worship God and then worship by obeying whatever assignment. Next week, if everything works out, I'm going to show you some things about creation, some uh, uh, pictures and things that I've been gathering. There's some astonishing stuff coming out from the scientific world. But today we're going to talk about this text and um, 
segue from it into the later part of their prayer. I want you to see what they're doing. They're praying, right? They have assembled together and because they need the walls of the city of Jerusalem rebuilt. Ezra has brought back the concept of rebuilding the city and now Nehemiah is there to help rebuild the walls and they are going to do that by the help of God. But it's interesting when a congregation is gripped with the presence of God, what we read is what always happens. When a people is gripped by the power of God, the presence of God, the word of God, look at what happens. I mean, everything we read always happens. People are broken in the presence of God. Amen? The nation was being restored, and now the walls were about to be restored. And in this week of thanksgiving, I think you and I need to stand and praise the Lord with our whole being. Amen? I don't want you to stand up right now. But I mean, we need to stand for. We, we say here in America, I want, I'm going to stand for something. Well, what we need to stand for is the presence and glory of God. We need to stand and say God is to be praised. Amen. He's the creator of everything. Wow. Whoever thought there would be a day in America when saying that God is the creator of everything would be argumentative. <clears throat> it would be perceived as um, offensive. You know, how can you say that? We've, we've sent little spaceships clear out past the the solar system and there's just no indication that God is the creator and the, the fact that you worship this God is off-putting. It's offensive to me. But God says, I've created all of this. And the people who know God, we get it. Amen? We get it. All right, now let's skip down to um, verse 19. Look at verse 19. Excuse me. But in your great mercy, you did not abandon them to die in the wilderness. Now they're praying, okay? This is a record of the congregational prayer. Now how they all prayed the same thing, I don't know. Except to say this is an incredible miracle. Or you might say that Ezra or Nehemiah, whoever's recording this, is capturing the wording that stood out to them. Or maybe it's just one person praying, and this is what they're praying on behalf of the whole congregation. But all through, from verse 5 all the way down and beyond what we're going to read is all this prayer. But in your great mercy, you did not abandon them, our ancestors, to die in the wilderness. The pillar of cloud still led them forward by day, and the pillar of fire showed them the way through the night. You sent your good spirit to instruct them, and you did not stop giving them manna from heaven or water for their thirst. For forty years you sustained them in the wilderness, and they lacked nothing. Their clothes did not wear out, and their feet did not swell. I want to focus on that word this morning from verse 19, still. In the New Living, still. Glory to God. And I want to talk to you this morning about three things that we see here that God is still doing. Amen? That you and I can lay hold of and say, God is still God. God still loves us. God is still with us. And even in what we're going through, God is still. I don't know if the government will be still after all of this. I don't know if the state government, the federal government... I don't know if the culture will still. I don't know if the electric companies will still. Always amazes me how much assumption we put in modern life. Well, well I'll turn the light switch on, the power will come on. What if a day comes and it doesn't? Well, pastor, that can't happen. Well, lots of things can happen. With God, nothing is impossible, Amen. And we say, well, you know, tomorrow I'm going to do this. And James warns all of the businessmen and women. I think it applies to everybody. How, how dare you say that we'll go here or there into this city or that city and we'll do business and we'll make profit. And, and he says, you don't even know your own life. We have to be careful. Our calling, our privilege is to give thanks to God, not just this coming Thursday, but every day because he is still. 
Here's the first thing, verse 19. Let's look at it again. But in your great mercy, you did not abandon them to die in the wilderness. The pillar of cloud still led them forward by day, and the pillar of fire showed them the way through the night. Number one this morning, the pillar is still protecting us. Amen? I think it's interesting that there were either, depending on how you see it, two pillars or one pillar of two different things. One is cloudy and one is fiery. Now, the word pillar could also, I think, this is just me, I think it could be imagined as column, a column of smoke and a column of fire. And then when you think of the temple, the Old Testament temple where God's presence dwelt, there were those two massive columns that Solomon had cast out of bronze. I I can't remember the height on them, but it is almost impossible to believe and the circumference and then they were capped at the top and they had names each of them had names and those names represented the character of God and you got to go back and you study them and you read from right to left in Hebrew and those two columns are there so that when you come into the temple you have to pass through the reminder of the smoke or, or cloud and the fire You had to be reminded of that every day. And I want to remind you and I today that God is still with us. In his fiery presence, in his smoky presence, he is with us in everything we go through. Did not matter how dark the night was, when they looked out from their tent, there was a column of fire out there standing between them and the darkness, between them and the enemy, between them and Satan, between them and disease. There was always a pillar or a column of fire. It didn't matter how bright the sun was in the noonday, no matter how bright and intimidating to your eyes, when they looked out of their tent, there was that column of cloud and that cloud always reminded them that the sun will not scorch you and the rain will not drown you I am here I am still with you. If there's ever a Thanksgiving, we may not be able to be with any family. We may have to video Skype everybody and say, hey, happy Thanksgiving. Hope you have a good turkey leg. But this Thanksgiving, if ever we were thankful, this is the one to say to God, thank you, thank you, thank you, because you are still protecting us. Amen. This is, um, I find this remarkable because in verse 18, the very preceding verse, they say to God in their prayer, our ancestors followed this fire and cloud into the wilderness and then made a golden calf and said to the calf, you will lead us. When you read it here in this context, you capture the heartbreaking reality of what they had done. And part of what they are doing here, these, this generation, you and I understand, they're, they're confessing and repenting. But there's also a subtext to this, and that is that they are realizing how natural that is for people, even the people of God to quickly forget who he is and what he does in the face of of the oncoming enemy, in the face of natural disasters, in the face of a pandemic and a virus. It's easy to get distracted and be captured by the intensity of that and look right past the cloud or the fire. But on this day, they are reminded, you're still with us. It's easy for us to say, I have no idea how they were able in such a quick moment to move from their, take their attention from God and put it onto that calf, but they did it. And you and I dare not say, oh, wow, I don't, I would never do that. We dare not say that. What we say is, God, we're all weak. We are all frail humans. We love you, but we are just as capable of abandoning you. But you are still God, and you're still protecting us, and you always will. We don't deserve the protection. That's what they were praying. There's no reason we have not earned your protection. They had created a gold calf to lead them, but only the Lord 
can lead his people. And today his word is still leading us day and night. If I haven't told you, you who are here, you have access to the notes and you joining us on live stream, you have access to the notes as well. They're on the church app. And so if you go there to the app and um, Pastor Pete's home right now probably yelling at me because I, I think it's under media that you click, but there's somewhere where you click and then it takes you right to the notes. So if you're filling them in, number one, the pillar is still protecting us. Praise God. It is protecting us. Our only protection comes from following his leading day and night. Our protection does not come from something that we're doing other than following him. Now what his protection looks like can vary from person to person as it is filtered through what he's assigned for us. Do you understand? I have no idea why, why some strong, loving believers are struck down with a virus while others are not. But it is filtered through. It's not that we abandon God and say, well, he failed because somebody... Somebody became very ill. No, that's filtered through what he has assigned for each of us. What I'm going through and what you are going through may be the exact same as far as situational. But as far as personal, nothing could be more different. Because each of us are unique. Each of us are not only unique as individual people, but we're unique in our assignment in God. He determines who rises and falls. He determines what I do and what you do. He determines how I serve him and how you serve him. Amen? But he is still protecting us. Come on. Amen? Even in the face of a virus moving here in our county, have you seen the rates? Like our county is, I mean, we're usually we're not number one in the state, but I think we should give ourselves a pat on the back. We're number one right now in something. It's not a very good thing, but... But we are number one. The rate is just, uh, I've seen it in the newspaper, and the rate of infection or positivity of the test is just staggering. But he is still protecting us. Amen? Now, here's the cool thing about God and his word, one of 10 billion great, deep, cool things. But that is when you dig into this, you can find out all kinds of layers about him protecting us. And that gives you your own personal spin on worshiping him and praising him and thanking him. Because you can say, not just generally or generically, he is still protecting us, but you can say, he's protecting me. I was positive, but he brought me through. I've not yet had the virus and he's keeping me. Or my loved one, I had a loved one that was compromised and very susceptible to this and I prayed and God has been with them you can find one of millions of reasons to personally say he is still protecting me that column of fire and that column of cloud will always be there to speak into my life to encourage me here's the second thing oh my guys don't have my big red numbers up there for me i got to watch today so I don't get carried away here. Go to uh, verse 20, just the first part of verse 20. You sent your good spirit to instruct them. Number two, the spirit is still speaking to us. The spirit is still speaking to us. Now they're referencing, they're remembering or going through God's word and they're being reminded they just read all of the law and the law included the book of Exodus and so they have heard what God had done. Remember, you did not have your own copy. No, 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 no. There were very few copies of God's word available and those were limited in where they were kept, and because they were so fragile, they were rarely brought out to be read. And so here is an amazing thing. The whole congregation of Israel is listening to God's word, and what they hear is, wow, God protected them, and he led them by his good spirit. New Living capitalizes it, and I think for us as New Testament believers, we could easily 
obviously add the word holy right there before. We know who he's talking about here. We know exactly what this is all about. And I want to remind us today that the Spirit is still speaking to you and I. So much else in our culture speaks to us. We live in a loud culture. I, uh, some mornings I'm walking, it happened again this morning. And, and I don't know why, I, li- I hear it more on Sunday mornings. And it really disturbs me. I don't hear it very often in my house, but I've mentioned it before. I'm assuming it's the volunteer fire companies. I don't think the downtown vocational fire department does it. But the volunteer fire companies here still ring that siren. I don't know what they're saying, but they ring the siren and it is ear piercing. I don't even know what community it is that I'm hearing. I don't know if it's Lavelle or Ridgely, but it rings and rings and rings. And then it waits for a minute or two when it stops, maybe seven. And you know which one I'm talking about? The outdoor. I'm not talking about the truck. I'm talking about the one up on the pole that's just screaming. And then I'm assuming nobody gets out of bed. Because other than me, I know, I've been out there many times in Chaplain Paul. Nobody's out of bed. (laughs) And then it starts again. And it is so offensive. And I'm thinking, listen, listen to me. They have cell phones. If you cannot get them to come to your fire department by calling them on the cell phone or texting them or sending them a Twitter, then you can forget it. Let me tell you even a better way. If they're under the age of 35, you need to contact them through their video game. All you got to do is send a note to them, make a group in their video game because they have them and they're all playing one together. They're all, as a matter of fact, that's why they're not getting up at five in the morning because they're sitting there going, blah, 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 blah. and then we can get away from this noise pollution. There are things, in, and that's just one of my pet peeves, but you and I have things in the culture that talk to us. Advertisers, up until recently, were spending billions and billions, tens of billions of dollars a year or more to advertise to us, to speak to us. The whole premise of social media is speaking to us. But the Bible says that he sent, he gave us his wonderful spirit his good spirit to instruct us. But it can be very difficult to submit when we are anxious. The Holy Spirit will never make you anxious. Let me say that again. God's Holy Spirit will never make you anxious. He will never make you fearful. Now, obviously, if you're talking about the fear of God, I think most of us understand that that's an entirely different context. That's a reverence. But I'm talking about being fearful. He will never confirm you in your disobedience. He will nudge you, woo you. He will gently try to correct you and I, and he often does, at least in my life. But he will not make us anxious. He will not make us fearful, tormented, terrorized. He will not. And no one speaking on his behalf will either. He sent his good spirit to instruct them. Praise God. And that, that's encouraging, isn't it? And he is still instructing you and I today. The Holy Spirit is available to us. How about that? In the midst of everything they're going through, one of the things that they declare in their prayer is the Holy Spirit is critical to the life of the believer. And if it was that way in Nehemiah's day, how much more in our day today? You need the presence of the Holy Spirit. You need the power of the Holy Spirit. You need the voice of the Holy Spirit. You need the word of God's Holy Spirit. You need his encouragement, his strength. You need his presence and his power. You need his anointing and his baptism. You need his prayer going through you because when we live in what we're living in, we've got to have something. Hallelujah. Oh, yeah, thank you. Listen, there are more of you here today than we're at the Masters Golf Tournament last weekend. So thank you. I never thought there'd be a day when in my church I'd have more people with me than Tiger Woods had with him. 
Praise God. See how God blesses you? You walk with God. It takes time, but he, he lifts you up over everybody else. Praise God. I'd still go see Tiger if I had a ticket, but the Holy Spirit is critical. And I think that's something that, that you can't ignore when you're going through these kinds of passages in the Old Testament. We think of the Holy Spirit as such a New Testament introduction for us, revelation to us, but over and over again we see him, we find him in the Old Testament, and because we find him there, we are reminded of the importance that God places on his people knowing his spirit, even though they had pillar or pillars, even though they had the fire and the cloud. God said, you must have the presence and the work of my spirit with you, my good spirit. I think we should start calling him that in the New Testament too and here in the church. Have you had an encounter with the good spirit? I like that. Because especially in the day and time in which we live, that is to demonstrate to you and I as opposed to have you had an encounter with the good spirit or have your encounters only been with the come on I'm fishing here gang I'm fishing I'm fishing I know the pond is small today but I'm fishing right if we're talking about good what would be the opposite of good yeah thank you bad Uh uh-huh right so and we hear this kind, and I know I'm taking this from the New Living, but, but I think it's apropos. It's perfect. And when we think of that, we have an encounter with God's good spirit or we are left. Listen, it does not mean then you have no encounters. There's no spiritual vacuum. There's no spiritual emptiness in God's creation. So we either walk in an encounter, we walk in a life infused with God's good spirit, or we are left to endure the presence of the enemy's bad spirits. Hmm, that puts a different spin on everything, doesn't it? Yeah, and I told you a moment ago that the Holy Spirit will not torment, terrorize. He will not bring fear. He doesn't bring doubt. He doesn't bring criticism. But I'll tell you what the bad spirits bring. Fear, doubt, uncleanness, criticism, (laughs) terror, torment. Yeah. So we are grateful. As we think about Thanksgiving this week and every day of our lives, we are grateful that the Spirit is still speaking to us. Amen? He is still speaking. I love that that whole phrase. You sent your good spirit to instruct them. We need instruction, don't we? I'm not being instructed regularly by God. I'm left to my own instruction. How many of you have tried to put something together before? Christmas is here in a few weeks and How many of you have had one of those, I don't want to paint with a broad brush, but this is often a dad moment. I don't know if ladies set us up to fail like this, but, and and again, this is too generalized, and I apologize if you're the guy and you go by the gift that has 83 steps to put the toy together, and the instructions were made in a country where they don't even speak English on a good day, let alone the average day. And uh, most of the parts are missing, and there's no pictures. And you YouTubed, and nobody else had ever put the thing together either. And so there you are trying to assemble this, and you have no instructions. And you say to the family who is trying to celebrate and, and honor you, and, Oh, Dad, it's okay. You're, it's going to be great. It, we'll get it eventually. And the kids, the little ones are over there playing in the box. And you say... I just needed instructions. <laughs> Some of you are uh, betraying your family. So maybe you know exactly what I'm talking about. Without instructions, we begin to assemble things our own way. And how many of you know, I certainly know, that when I follow my own instructions, it can only end in disaster. He sent his good spirit to instruct us. Praise God. If we do not follow his good spirit, we will, by default, we will end up listening to the other one's bad spirits. It's, that's just the way it is. You can say, well, no, I just don't care about the spiritual realm. I don't go there and I don't... No, no, it's not whether you go there or not. It comes to you. 
The darkness finds us. That's why God put a pillar of fire there. He didn't say, listen, it's, you don't need anything because you can do all right. Just ignore the darkness. Stay in your tent. You know it was just as dark inside the tent as it was outside the tent at nighttime. God knows what we need. He understands us and he knows what we're up against more than we do. And so he gave his good spirit. Here's the third and final thing. Now let's pick it up in the rest of verse 20. And you did not stop. Hmm. And you did not stop. Hallelujah. Thank God. He did not stop giving them manna from heaven or water for their thirst. For 40 years you sustained them in the wilderness and they lacked nothing. Their clothes did not wear out and their feet did not swell. Glory to God. You talk about supernatural. Number three today, the Savior is still sustaining us. Now this is the word I went looking for. Because I was praying a couple of times this week and uh, I realized that in my prayer, I was looking to be satisfied. When you look through the Bible and you find the word satisfied and you do a search on it, you're going to find that almost every time that word is used, God does promise to satisfy us again and again. And we're reading the Psalms right now together and, and much of that the use of that shows up several times in the Psalms, but almost every time it's connected to him sustaining our soul or what you and I would say in the context it would be our spirit. I'm sorry, I used the word sustaining there and that's not what I wanted to use. I wanted to use the word satisfying. But what he promises to do is to sustain us. And there's a big difference And I felt the Holy Spirit check me this week. Not not instantly, it took me time, but I kept kind of going bouncing between those words, and it felt like those words were not the same. They were not synonymous. And so I started looking into them, and I looked at God's word where he does all this satisfying, and I realized that his promises for satisfaction, to satisfy me as his child, almost always speak to my spirit. But when I say, God, you know my needs, my physical, my, my daily needs, when Jesus said, give us this day our daily bread, he, he was encouraging us to pray for that. Those are the promises that he will sustain us. And here's the difference, and you and I know it, right? But we don't always think about it, and sometimes we struggle with it. To sustain us is to give us what we need to survive. To satisfy us is to give us everything we want. He will not do that. He will give us everything our spirit wants, but I don't, it's not possible for me to know in this life what it is my spirit wants. I know my spirit wants to love God and read his word. I know my spirit wants to worship him and my spirit wants to fast. Boy, this has been a tough day for fishing. <laughs> Come on, you you were happy, happy there a little bit ago. I know my spirit wants to, but I struggle because the other part of me doesn't want to, the part that you see and the part that I feel. And that's where the battle comes in. But Jesus has promised that he will sustain us. And so these guys, look now, are there times when he does a sustaining that could be interpreted as satisfying? Well, you judge For yourself, you did not stop giving them manna from heaven, but they complained about it. Right? And you gave them water for their thirst, but Moses struck the rock twice and was punished. You sustained them in the wilderness and they lacked nothing. Their clothes did not wear out, but the moment Achan got the opportunity to take some extra garments as they started in to the cities of the promised land. He disobeyed God and their feet did not swell. 
See, we have to remind ourselves that we often, at least I did, we often confuse these two and we say in, in our prayers we're making declarations, but God, you have promised to satisfy my every need. And of course, I can't discern between my needs and my wants. What he's promised to do is to sustain me. Now, sometimes his sustaining of you looks like he's gone too far to me. Like, oh, why'd you do that for them? But you're not doing it for me. That's And what I'm trying to tell you, I'm not criticizing the Old Testament saints for struggling. They ate the same food every day for 40 years. I'm not sure I would be thrilled with that either, although I'm convinced now that I was misguided because I see the same people in line down at Chick-fil-A every day, every single day. If it was open on Sunday, it'd be seven days a week. They're in line. At Chick we were in uh, Hagerstown the other day. Three, three lines at like seven o'clock at night, backed up, clear out onto the main road. Three. Like it's chicken, gang. Chicken and a pickle. That's it. No offense, Brother Levi. But here are people who get tired of it and they criticize it because they're frustrated. But nevertheless, God is sustaining them. He promised to do it. Now, it may look to you like the person down the street from you is getting satisfied by God and you're only being sustained. But I want to remind you that to them... That's not the case. You and I are all being loved equally by God. We're all being protected equally by God. We're all being instructed by his good spirit equally by our loving father. And we are all being sustained until the day of the revelation of Jesus Christ. He will take care of us. Our feet will not swell. Our clothes will not wear out. We will have everything we need. We may not get everything we want for our physical body, for our circumstances, in our situation, but he will sustain us. He has promised and his promise cannot be broken. When you're in the midst of a physical ailment, when you're facing your own diagnosis of the virus or anything else, you cry out to God and say, you have promised to sustain me. You have promised to take me through and I'm not going to let go of that promise. Amen. Hallelujah. He has promised to sustain us. At times I feel like I Need him to satisfy me. Oh, God, I need more money. I need more of this or more of that. That's nah, usually more money. But, <laughs> hello? Come on, you let me up here all by myself to take all this conviction only for me. I think, it's, I think there's plenty to go around. Amen? Bread from heaven, water from the rock, supernatural clothing, and blessed health. What? An incredible God. The pillar is still protecting us. The Spirit is still speaking to us. And the Savior is still sustaining us. He is. The, these are tough days. The, the, there's just no doubt. None of us. I haven't met anybody yet that likes what we're going through. None of us want to be enduring what we're enduring. But we're here. And that's okay. Many, many, many people in our world are going through it without the Savior, but you and I are going through this with the Savior, and he will sustain us. It looks at times like he's forgotten you or I. It looks at times like he's doing more for somebody else than he is for you or I. But I want to tell you, I want to remind you based on the authority of his word and the promise of his oath that he will sustain every one of us. He has promised. Well, pastor, I don't know if he knows me. I don't know if he knows my address. I don't know if you know him, he knows you. If you want to be known by him, he wants to be known by you. But I just, I don't, I don't know if I have that kind of faith. It doesn't take faith. It first takes repentance. That's why they started with repentance. And that's why when you and I start with repentance, God immediately shows up. He just does. That's his nature. It's his character. But more than anything, it's his promise. And God cannot break his promise. He cannot lie. He cannot. Not to me. Not to others, and not to you. He cannot. It's impossible. And on this holiday Sunday, as you enter into the Thanksgiving week, as you and I, uh, maybe it's just your immediate family, maybe you're even separated from your immediate family, 
I want to remind you that he's still with you. He's still there. Whatever you've known about him in the past, he still is. Whatever you've had him do for you in the past, he's still doing. What, whatever you've experienced, he's still providing. Amen. Bow your hearts with me today, please, and let's look to the King of glory. Lord Jesus, thank you today that you are everything that I've said, everything your word says, and everything beyond that. If we had all the languages of the world and could speak them all, we could not praise you enough. If we knew all of the languages of heaven and we could speak them all, we could not speak enough of the goodness of God. We don't have enough time now, nor will we for eternity. Lord Jesus, you have made so much available to us. It's overwhelming. And then you promised that you were going away to prepare more for us. Glory to God. Thank you. In this Thanksgiving week, we say thank you for preparing more for us. Hallelujah. Your saints gathered together in Jerusalem, cried out to you 2,500 years ago and said, Oh God, we've heard your word. And what we've heard is overwhelming. We have heard the promises of our God even when we disobeyed, even when we strayed off course. Still you were with us. Still you were providing for us. Still you were keeping your hand on us. And still we will come into your presence and say thank you. Hallelujah. Thank you. Still. You who are watching me, if you do, if you do not have a relationship with the King of Glory, what are you waiting for? You get into the middle of this virus and things turn in a moment, you may not have time, you may not have the strength or the energy that you have right now to call out on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and say, I need you. And you might be saying, yeah, but I, I haven't turned to him my whole life. I, I feel like it would be hypocritical to do it now. Listen, there has to be a time, a day and an hour. It's no difference between when you were 12 and when you're 70. No difference at all. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And with him there is no time. But for you, there's only right now. You need to trust Jesus. I don't mean, well, I think there's really a God up there. No, I mean you need to turn everything over to him. You need to turn off your own guidance system. It's got you in trouble again and again, and you need to cry out to God and say, I should have done this 40 years ago, but I'm doing it now. Come on. Get there in your chair, next to your kitchen table. Maybe you're still in the bed, but you begin to cry out. Bow your head. You don't have to be on your knees, but bow your head, lift your hands, do something that says to the King of glory, I respect you. And then you tell him, Break this ungodly individual. Break me. And then put me back together the way you want to. And then just begin, begin to give him praise. Just begin to say, Jesus, you are worthy of it all. You are worth all of my praise and worship, and I cannot thank you enough. When you do that, the power of God will be right there power of God will show up, open his word, jump in, maybe right here in Nehemiah and just begin to read chapter 9 and you make it your prayer and you watch what God does, he'll make it his prayer too. And you and he together will have fellowship. Hallelujah. Across the building this morning here in the sanctuary, would you guys stand with me this morning and let's take a couple of moments for prayer. Thank you for being patient with me while I talk to everybody who's joined us on live stream today. God can use this across this nation. God can use it around the world. It's my job to know that he'll do that. But you're here today because God brought you physically to this place on purpose. Hallelujah. On purpose. Because he wanted to remind you that he's still working for you. I'm going to take two minutes this morning. I'm, I'm, I've done a good job today. We're, we're on time, maybe even a couple of minutes early, but we're going to take two minutes. 
And I want you to either make an altar there where you are, if that's how you're most comfortable, or I'm going to open the altar here, okay? And by doing that, what I want is for you to feel comfortable, if you feel comfortable, to slide into the altar anywhere across the front. Pastor, why is it important for me to step out? It's not critical, but if you feel it's important, if the Holy Spirit's tugging you, then this altar is available for you. And you can just step into it. In other words, you just stand anywhere you want to stand, distance from somebody, keep your mask on, and just say to the Lord, on this Thanksgiving Sunday, thank you that you still are. As I pray, if you want to slip out, you can do that. Then Brother Ricky's going to lead us in a worship time, and uh, he'll get us out of here this morning. Gang, I love you. If you feel disconnected, you're at home watching me, would you take time, text me, call me, Pastor, you're busy. I am not. Call me, and I'll pray with you. I'll send you a prayer by text, but don't get disconnected. You who are here, stay in touch with us however you feel comfortable. Father, this morning, as we take a few moments to, to linger in your presence, thank you that you still are. As we linger in your presence, thank you that your spirit still is. As we congregate in this great sanctuary, thank you that those pillars still protect. That your spirit still speaks and your son, our Savior, is still sustaining us. Wonderful Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. If you want to slip into the altar, please feel free to do so. If you want me to pray for you, I'd be happy to do that. But uh, mostly, I just want to give you a chance to spend some time in the presence of the Lord. They're at your pew or here at the front. I love you. Have a beautiful, beautiful week. Brother Ricky, take us into some worship.